From viewers worldwide, this is FSN. Yeah, thanks very much, Natalie. Very interesting stuff, that last story there. It is Wednesday, April 3rd. It's a lovely afternoon here in Manchester after a very cold day. My name is Richie Allen. How are you doing? Are you well? Have you had a good day? Terrific uh, show, I think, lined up for you. Got a great guest. Jake Morphonios joins the program in around about 30 minutes time. That's going to be fascinating, that. And as always, I'm on Twitter, so talk to me now. Talk to me right now, I tells you. Richie Allen. It's the Richie Allen Show. Broadcasting live on RichieAllen.co.uk and multiple platforms around the world. And now, here's your host, Richie Allen. Yeah, Jake Morphonios is uh, an investigative journalist and the chief investigator for the Blackstone Intelligence Network. And he's had a fascinating career, has Jake, which has taken him to Southeast Asia, amongst other things. And he also found himself writing speeches for a very noteworthy political candidates in the United States. I'm looking forward to an extended interview with Jake. He joins me at around about half past the hour or thereabouts. And as I did mention, I know that you'll have questions for him. You can put them to me through Twitter and I will put them to him. Right, before that, a news roundup. It's Wednesday's show. We are live as usual on TuneIn.com. Tens of thousands of people listening through TuneIn. Dot com every day, where there are about 500,000 radio stations. I'm on Fab Radio 2, TriggerWarning.tv, and of course the program streams round the clock on RichieAllen.co.uk. Yeah. Ah, shut up, Richie. I don't need you shouting at me, Richie. Fair enough. <laughs> right. Enthusiasm, dear. Enthusiasm. If I can't retain my enthusiasm, I'm finished. So I am. Hi to Martin, who's listening in Spain with his mate Matthew, who's a scientist. Matthew doesn't look like a scientist sitting topless in the Spanish sunshine. Oh, I'm envious. Wouldn't mind being there now. Uh, how you doing, Martin? How you doing, Matt? Hi to William. Yeah, I, 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 I dropped a little Joe Pesci clip in just before the programme started. It's from Casino, and it's when Pesci... Playing Nicky Santoro, if I remember correctly. Nicky Santoro. Uh, Joe Pesci threatens the banker to give him back the money that he lost or else he would do some violence to him. Not good. Violence is never good, children. We don't ever endorse violence, ever. Unless you have to defend yourself against it. Otherwise, violence is not a means to solving our disputes with anybody. Now, you heard Natalie Powell talking about Theresa May and the fact that she's meeting Jeremy Corbyn today to find a way through Brexit. Yesterday, she spent hours with her cabinet colleagues and emerged to say that she was going to go and meet meet with Jeremy Corbyn. Hopefully, they would be able to come to some agreement that they could jointly present to Parliament. Jeremy Corbyn said, well, it's good, I'm happy, said Jezza. And it's good the Prime Minister is willing to compromise to solve this deadlock. But Brexiteers or the backbench Conservative MPs, those who want to leave and properly leave, are well cheesed off. The Wales Minister Nigel Adams resigned his role. In his resignation letter, he said the government was at risk of failing to deliver what people voted for. As well as meeting with Corbyn, she's also meeting, Theresa May is meeting with uh, uh, Jimmy Cranky, the Scottish First Minister. I never miss an opportunity to say that. That's, of course, Nicola Sturgeon and the Welsh First Minister, Mark Drakeford. Now, Julian Lewis, who's a Conservative MP, Theresa May's colleague, he's not at all happy that she's meeting with uh, Jeremy Corbyn to try and figure out what to do next. He isn't alone, but here's Julian Lewis at Prime Minister's Questions today. Julian Lewis! What is a Conservative Prime Minister who repeatedly told us that no deal is better than a bad deal, now approaching Labour MPs to block a WTO Brexit when most Conservative MPs want us to leave the European Union with a clean break in nine days' time. Prime Minister! 
can I say to my honourable friend? I've always, I was absolutely right, no deal is better than a bad deal, but we've got a good deal. Yeah. And, and I want, we had a chance last Friday to ensure that we would leave the European Union on the 22nd of May, and I'm grateful to all those colleagues who supported that, uh, that motion. Some of them, I know, did it with a very heavy heart. But I want to ensure that we deliver Brexit. I want to ensure that we do it in an orderly way, as soon as possible, without fighting European elections. But to do that, we need to find a way of this House agreeing the withdrawal agreement and agreeing uh, the uh, and agreeing the way forward. Yeah, it's very funny. Julian Lewis is a man of a certain vintage. He's a little bit older, and there are quite a few older conser conservative male MPs, absolutely beside themselves that May has gone to Jeremy Corbyn to come to an agreement about Brexit. It's absolutely hilarious to see them. My God, man, she's meeting with that communist. Did you know he slept with a black? My God, that's her sitting right there. The Prime Minister is in league with the communists and the blacks. <laughs> that's how they think. It's not me. I have no problems with Jeremy Corbyn's prior relationship with Diane Abbott. The blacks, can you believe it? Anyway, Jacob Rees-Mogg was on with Kay Burley. I, I, I haven't had a drink, I promise you. Never done that before, before coming on air. Jacob Rees-Mogg then, terminological inexactitude darling, was on with Kay Burley this afternoon. What does Jacob think about Theresa May? Well, fraternising with communists and blacks in order to solve Brexit. Well, well let's leave that messing around. Let's just stop messing, Richie. What does Rhys Mogg think about the Corbyn, the Corbyn Brexit saviour idea from Theresa May? Well, I think it's a mistake to try and uh, think that Jeremy Corbyn will be the answer to Brexit. The problem is that both Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party and Theresa May and a lot of her top team back to remain. So in this effort to find a compromise, who is representing the 17.4 million people who voted to leave? I think it's a fundamental problem of democracy at the moment and the people are, are against Parliament. Parliament is about two thirds remain and only one third leave, whereas the British people voted by 52% to leave. But we are where we are. There is an on pass unless we have a deal uh, that looks as though it can get through by next Wednesday. We are likely to crash out Without a deal, crash out. I know you'll pick me up on that. That is the phraseology used by some well, Remainers. Do you think that that's Bailey, acceptable? I, I, would, I would never dream of picking you up because you're an impeccably impartial uh, interviewer. <laughs> Good stuff. That's the gag of the day. Um, but I think crashing out is precisely the wrong term. That there is a system outside the European Union. Most countries in the world trade very successfully without being members of the European Union. We would move to that basis of trading, WTO terms as it's known. A, a lot of effort has been made to ensure that we're prepared. But equally important, the EU has made steps to ensure that it's prepared as well for us leaving um, in a few days. And that's what should now happen. And interestingly, that's what Parliament legislated for. We're often told that Parliament won't sanction no deal, but Parliament passed two laws that provided for no deal, the Article 50 Act and the Withdrawal Act. Yeah, he, he explained quite well how there wouldn't be any food shortages or medicine shortages and all of that jazz in a longer interview. I'm not going to play it all for you. He gave it straight about the UK importing goods from around the world. He did a good job explaining why no deal is a good thing. Then Kay Burley went a little bit mad, as she is wont to do. She said the farmers disagreed with him, and she talked about lambs, Kay Burley. I heard a farmer on the radio over the weekend saying that if uh, we did come out of the European Union without a deal, that three million lambs would have to be slaughtered. <laughs> Could you have that on your conscience? Um, oh. Well, those are lambs that are going to be slaughtered anyway because they're going to be eaten. So it's not any different whether they're uh, slaughtered in the UK or, or elsewhere. And actually, it's the meat that is at issue, not the lambs themselves. What kind of fuckery is this? <laughs> ah, looking back in years to come, I, I will remember how surreal some of the interviews were at the time. In 2030, 
looking back at some of these interviews. Let's just hear Kay again, because that was just, that is world class. It doesn't get any better. Do you want to hear it? I heard a farmer on the radio over the weekend saying that if uh, we did come out of the European Union without a deal, that three million lambs would have to be slaughtered. Could you have that on your conscience? <laughs> Jacob Priest Mogg, it's all your fault. We should remake The Silence of the Lambs. Clarice could be played by Burley. She looks a bit like her. And Jacob, um, yeah, I could see him playing uh, old Dr. Lecter. Wonderful. Could you have it on your conscience? Well, those are lambs that are going to be slaughtered anyway because they're going to be eaten. So. <laughs> Absolutely. It's the most surreal. Being me. I'll write a book called Being Richie Allen. Being a, a journalist, a radio presenter and producer. Listening to this stuff day in, day out. Anyway... He lays it out fairly simple about the importation of goods and the exportation, Jacob Rees-Mogg. One of the areas that would be affected by tariffs, most particularly, uh, is lamb. Um, and I think we would have to take steps to compensate lamb farmers. And you're right to highlight that there are some areas where there would be particular difficulties. And those are areas where the government would be able to use some of the £39 billion that we would save to ensure that there was compensation uh, for people affected. But most businesses would carry on in exactly the same way. We import goods from outside the European Union through Southampton with a clearance time of six seconds. There doesn't need to be a long delay at ports of entry. Pretty good that, you know, we, we get a lot more coming in through Southampton from around the world than we do from Europe. And it only takes a few seconds to clear it. There doesn't need to be all of this hassle that we are being warned about, all the fear-mongering. Jacob uh, then says, and we're going to leave Brexit after this, you'll be glad to know, that ultimately this comes down to putting the people first and not politicians. Well, I think um, a customs union and common market 2.0 don't deliver on the referendum result to leave the European Union. And I think it's surprising that a Prime Minister who said quite clearly that the leader of the opposition was unfit to govern last week thinks that he should practically be Deputy Prime Minister this week. I I'm not <laughs> sure that's an approach I would recommend. She has said that she has finally decided to put the country rather than the party first. What are you doing? Oh, I'm putting the country first, but I'm putting democracy first. You see, I trust the people. The people voted to leave, 17.4 million of them, a majority. And I think the people know best. I don't think Whitehall mandarins know best. I don't think politicians know best. I think the British people know best. And that Parliament should be delivering on the referendum result and not lecturing people, frightening people, uh, and trying to overturn the referendum result and avoid leaving. Good man. 16 minutes past the hour. The Richie Allen Show, live on April 3rd, 2000 and. 19. Let's leave Brexit there. So the army is using Jeremy Corbyn for target practice. That's not true, really. Some, some soldiers in Kabul who are about to finish their deployment there have been putting videos out showing themselves firing paintball pellets at an image of Jeremy Corbyn. And uh, people are up in arms about this today. No pun intended. People are really cheesed off about this today. Brigadier Nick Perry, Brigadier General Nick Perry, said the army was taking this very seriously and would fully investigate. Here's Brigadier General Nick Perry in conversation with a Sky News reporter. Brigadier General. Well, the video shows uh, totally unacceptable behaviour and a serious error of judgement uh, that falls far below uh, the behaviour that we expect of, uh, of our soldiers in the brigade. So what now? What have you established and what's the next step? So the army uh, is conducting a full investigation uh, and obviously taking this extremely seriously uh, and we want to get to uh, the bottom of, of what happened. Can you tell us any more about the individuals in the video, why they're in Afghanistan, what their role has been? So our... Of course that's very important, isn't it? Lost in all of this nonsense about them firing some pellets at a Jeremy Corbyn picture, is the brilliant question there unwittingly asked by the Sky reporter who doesn't know his arse from his elbow. Why are they in Afghanistan? What a question that is. Why don't we stay with that? Uh, but they don't, unfortunately, stay with that. 
Can we get these little bastards, can we, and embarrass them publicly, can we? Our, uh, we have about 400 soldiers from the brigade uh, conducting force protection uh, in Afghanistan and working closely with both NATO and Afghan partners. Uh, and uh, these soldiers uh, have, are doing an outstanding job uh, in theatre, but this serious error, error of judgment uh, is being fully investigated by the army. The target is the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn. It, is it isn't, it's, it's a picture of Jeremy Corbyn. It's a picture of Jeremy that they were firing paintball slugs at. That's all it is. <laughs> it's not Jeremy Corbyn himself. What's the big deal here? It is a central pillar to the British Armed Forces, not just the Army, but the Armed Forces as a wider body, body that they are apolitical. And this would seem to fall short of that, would you agree? So, let me be clear. The Army is, and always will be, a, a totally apolitical organisation. Bullshit. And this is a Syria, serious error of judgement. Yeah, it's a Syria error of judgement. There's, uh, there's another little Freudian slip there. Look, it's funny that some of the momentum types, some of the far left types that follow Corbyn are screaming about this today and they're invoking the name of Joe Cox, the MP who was murdered just before the referendum and they're saying that this is terrible and it's dreadful. All the virtue signalers, Stella Creasy, who hates Corbyn anyway, ironically, coming out of the woodwork, crying about this. If these lads were firing pellets at... Uh, I don't know, Thatcher or David Cameron or George Osborne or Theresa May herself, they wouldn't be as quick to 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 run to Twitter to virtue signal about it. This is a bunch of lads that are in Kabul. Of course, the, the wonderful thing there, as I've just said, and I'm going to repeat myself, is why aren't we talking about what is the British Army still doing in Afghanistan? But no, we're, we're talking about a bunch of yahoos firing a few pellets at a picture. At some time or another, everybody has fired a dart at a dartboard with a picture of somebody. <laughs> right? It's not voodoo. It's not going to hurt Jeremy Corbyn. And none of these lads are likely to want to really do any harm to Jeremy Corbyn at all. It's ridiculous, really. As far as I'm concerned, and I have no truck with any of them, left, right, centre, ground, I couldn't care less about any politician, man or woman. Much ado about nothing, but it's uh, a big story this afternoon. Brigadier General Nick Perry. Del Bigtree, the film producer, has wound up the Jews. Well, some of them anyway. He started something a few days ago. Uh, this is the guy who produced the film Vaxxed. He started wearing the yellow star of David at rallies to, to protest about mandatory vaccination. So he's been using the yellow star of David to symbolise the persecution of parents who refuse to vaccinate. This isn't new news. This has been um, doing the rounds for the last two or three days. But it's caught on, this. It's caught on and other, o other opponents of mandatory vaccination are using the yellow star of David as well. And, well, some of, some of the Jews are not happy. Parents and children who oppose vaccinations are being persecuted, there's no doubt. Let's hear from Olivier Rafovich. Olivier Rafovich is a community leader in Tel Aviv. He's apoplectic. I can't believe these anti-vax people are using the yellow star of David. Shirt is positively racist. The yellow star for the Jewish people uh, is a bad remembrance for us. You know, uh, it's to mark people uh, because of what they are. And uh, we paid the Jewish people paid a terrible price because of this uh, yellow star. Jew or not Jew, you don't, you have no right to use these symbols because you make them uh, becoming part of a uh, political, I would say, game, and you make them becoming cheap. And we cannot forget when children, uh, women and people were wearing this yellow star, what happened to them? And what happened to them? It was this, it was to be burned to be sent to uh, gas chambers. So uh, if people are doing so, even they are Jews, they are doing a terrible mistake. And for me, it's a terrible abuse. And I think it's, a, it's, it's something that should be punished by law. They should be punished by law for wearing the Star of David and saying that we are being persecuted for our beliefs, just as Jews were persecuted in Nazi Germany. There's the, the, the nary, nary a day goes by without some buffoon, some plonker 
taking offence at something that really is pretty inoffensive. Anyway, I would have thought the Jews, particularly Zionist Jews, would have been delighted that somebody's wearing the Star of David. You know, I thought we were supposed to be thinking about the Holocaust at least 500 times a day. You know, I do anyway, before I go to bed, when I get up in the morning, before I have my breakfast, before I go for my run, when I go walking with the dog, I think of the Holocaust as every person should. And if you don't, you should be sent off for re-education. It's the way it should be. But look, there's a massive media drive going on all over the world to denounce critics of vaccines or critics of mandatory vaccination. And the media is trying to ram home the notion that vaccines are absolutely good and there is no cause for concern. Now, the BBC Victoria Derbyshire show featured a couple whom are expecting a child this coming August. The couple do not want to vaccinate. They're worried. They have been seeing things on the internet that have given them cause to worry and they've decided not to vaccinate their child. So the BBC sent them to ask some questions of so-called experts. The couple first went to Professor Beata Kampman at the Vaccine Centre and they asked her a question. Why do you think it is uh, acceptable to inject aluminium into a baby when it is being banned in such things as aerosols? That's not a bad question at all. In vaccine, injecting aluminium into babies when it's been banned in aerosols, why do you do that? What do the experts say? It's lots and lots of people are really concerned about what are the extra ingredients in vaccines and alum is a very, very important part of the vaccines because it actually helps the stuff that's really important in the vaccines, which is the bacterial viral ingredients, to work well in the body. Now, you make it sound as if we're giving a massive shot of aluminium to the body. So that's not at all the case. So the concentration of aluminium in it is like a thousandth of what you find in natural environment and what we already have in our bodies as well. If you ask uh, the nurse who's giving the vaccines in the surgery what is exactly in that vaccine, he or she will not be able to tell you. That is exactly our point. I'm and, glad you and, said that. And it's not good enough, you know. And it's not even part of nursing education. Hmm. I wonder why. That was Beata Kampman from the Vaccine Centre. So then the couple whom are reluctant to vaccinate their child in August, they then popped off to see a GP called Julian Spinks. And they had a very good question for Julian Spinks, the GP. So we're just wondering whether um, GPs are pressurised to meet um, targets for financial gain. Very good. Are general practitioners given targets? And are they gaining financially if they meet those targets? Excellent question, young woman. Well, we do have some targets. Um, however, we do have targets, he said. However, actually, the money involved with vaccination is relatively small. The amount of money we get for um, a vaccine uh, is about £10. Ah, so they only get £10 every time they convince one of their patients to have a vaccine. Only 10 quid. Ah. Uh, by the time you've covered the cost we have, which is paying for nurses and buildings and so on, well over half of that is gone. So actually, realistically, it's a very small amount of money we get and certainly way short of something that would actually make me want to do something which was putting children in harm's way. Mm. Only a tenner per vax and they do have targets. I know this because I talked about this three years ago when I was pressured by my GP to have the flu jab and I said no. And when the GP left the room to get something, some information that I should have, I had a chat with the nurse and she was a young woman and she was nice and she said to me, uh, Richie, they're under, they, meaning the doctors, are under enormous pressure to convince you to have these vaccines. That was three, four years ago, in fact. What the couple might have asked the doctor just for the crack was they should have said, doctor, do you know what every ingredient is contained in the flu jab? Because I think if they had have asked him to do that, I think he probably would have asked them to turn off the camera. That's just my opinion. They do not know either. Doctors are basically, well, they're, doctors these days sit in front of a computer. They get to spend five minutes with a patient. When the patient is telling the doctor what's, how, how they're feeling and why they are, in fact, in the surgery, the doctor is just typing stuff into a computer and getting an answer. This is not a joke. This is what goes on. I wanted to talk a bit about Brunei and their new laws about um, 
gay sex and adultery. This is absolutely batshit crazy, lunatic asylum stuff that makes um, gay sex punishable, punishable by death by stoning. It's insane. It's so crazy and scary for gay men and women in that part of the world. And there's a lot of questions to be asked of the UK government and the Irish government and every other government that does business with this lunatic asylum of a regime in Brunei. No doubt about that. But I don't have time to get into that now. 28 minutes past the hour. I'm pretty sure that Jake Morphonios is standing by to chat with us live. We'll have him on for an extended interview. This is your Richie Allen show and there's nothing like it, I don't think anyway. All righty. Welcome to it. This is music from The Who, a song called The Seeker. The time is 28 and a half minutes past the hour. Back in a minute with Jake Morphonios. Music from The Who on The Richie Allen Show, Europe's most listened to independent radio show. The time, 29 minutes to the top of the hour. Glorious afternoon in Manchester. We don't get the sun very much in this city, so uh, I think people are sunbathing <laughs> in April. No, they're not really. Let's welcome our guest to the programme. I'm very excited about talking to him. We've got a lot of mutual friends, and I know a lot of uh, the listeners to this programme are very much aware of, of who he is. Fascinating career he's had. It's taken him all around the world over the years to Southeast Asia, incredibly where he worked with the victims of child sex trafficking there. He wrote and translated speeches for government officials. He's worked for Ron Paul. He's worked for Steve Forbes. It's an amazing career. I thought I'd done a lot in being around the world, but this man is, well, he puts me in the shade, to be honest. He's an investigative reporter, journalist, and he is the chief investigator for the Blackstone Intelligence Network, which leads investigations into all manner of very interesting things, very shady areas. Let's welcome him to the programme. Let's say hi to Jake Morphonios. Jake, welcome to our show. How are you? Richie, hello. It is so great to talk with you. It's an honour. I'm delighted to have you on finally. I really am. And I have so many things I, w- I want to talk to you about. And we're getting loads of tweets already, uh, Jake. So we'll, we, we will pause when we can so we can get some of, some of the tweets because there are a lot of questions coming in for you, really interesting questions. Your career, Jake, what a career. Southeast Asia working with victims of child sex trafficking, helping government officials translate speeches. What I'd like to ask you is, at what point in your career, in your life, did you start to think, this is my favourite question, something Mm -hmm. is not right here. Something is very wrong in terms of what we're told by the press, by the media. When was it your epiphany, if I could describe it as such? Richie, my my epiphany, like a lot of people, came after 9-11, But I I guess I had some false starts earlier on. My grandmother had been a a famous criminal court judge down in Miami, Florida, and she tried a lot of uh, really high-profile cases, really intense stuff, mass murders, all kinds of things. And uh, there was a period of time when the Federal Bureau of Investigation decided that they were going to go after, well, pretty much whoever they could. And so they targeted judges down in, in South Florida. They did something called Operation Court Broom, where what they did was they went around and started uh, basically bribing judges. They created a fake case involving a mafia, and they were using crooked attorneys to go around trying to offer tens of thousands of dollars to judges to give uh, to to slip the name of of a a fake informant who didn't exist over to the mafia's attorney so that they could whack them. So they went around and they actually flipped a number of attorneys. Then they flipped a bunch of judges. Then they came after my grandmother and she wouldn't, she wouldn't do it. She, you just would have nothing, nothing to do with it. So they tried to get some of the judges that they had turned to try and set her up. None of the judges would go for it. They had a lot of respect for her. But during those years that they went after my grandmother, and I was, uh, she raised me for part of my life. I lived with her a lot growing up. So I grew up with the FBI following us around. They made no secret about it. We would go out to Outback Steakhouse, and uh, they would make it known. They would sit there in the parking lot uh, next to our car, wait till we'd go back out, drive home. They'd follow us there and then just circle the block. They were very overt. So early on, I I didn't have a disdain for uh, the FBI, 
but I, I didn't understand it. I thought, well, I guess these guys are just trying to do the best they, they can, but we dealt with wiretaps and just years of harassment. Then when I, I ended up a handful of years later working in Southeast Asia, one of the cities that I had moved up to, to do some work was on the border of Burma. It's a tiny little town called Chiang Rai. And in Chiang Rai, what I did not know was that just in the weeks prior to when I moved there, which was in January of 95, uh, this is, this is what's known as the, the golden triangle. This is at this time uh, in the world, it was the leading producer of opium, uh, in the whole world. And the guy who was the warlord that was m producing more opium than anybody else in the world was, a uh, was a man named Kun Sa. He was a, a, a general had an army of 40,000 people. He was, uh, he was trying to, <laughs> trying to overthrow the government of Burma, basically. Well, the United States central intelligence agency had been operating out of Chiang Rai in the weeks before I moved there. And they had helped, they worked with the Thai government and ended up busting a number of Kun Sa's, uh, uh, top, top, uh, leaders that he had there in Thailand that were helping with the uh, drug trade. What was going on was that the CIA was trying to get their cut of Kun Sa's, uh, business. And he didn't, uh, he didn't want to give that to them. He saw no reason for it, but long story short, after they, they took some of his, um, his people into custody, the CIA pulled out of Chiang Rai just like I said, weeks before I, I moved up there. I'm the only white guy within, you know, miles. Kun Sa's headquarters was 20 miles away from where I was living. I got a call from the U S embassy saying, uh, we're aware that you're up there and, uh, you'd best go into hiding. <laughs> wow. They said, don't go, don't go to the bus stations. We've, we've, uh, we've been told that inter uh, communications have been inter intercepted saying that they are looking for the American. They believe that you're central intelligence agency and they intend to, to take you and hold you hostage, uh, for, for ransom, which was something that, uh, Kun Sa was, was known for. Uh, so I spent the next couple of weeks in my apartment. I had, uh, I paid, paid a woman to go and get food and things like that, bring it back. Eventually I got the okay from the U S embassy and I hightailed it out of there. Uh, but that was another one of those things where at that point I was still a staunchly, I don't want to say pro government, but I was not yet awake to how it works. I just thought, okay, we've got our CIA, they're doing work against a bad guy. I got caught in the crossfire. No big deal. But after nine 11, uh, two days after nine 11, where I were started... you, Jake, where were you when it happened? It, Cause I, I actually worked for a commercial, a very, a very big commercial radio station in Ireland. So I was actually giving a play by play account. I shouldn't say it like that. It sounds mm. uh, very callous. Sure. I was explaining it to my audience on live radio as it was happening. Where were you when it happened? At the time I was the director of a hunger relief agency in Northwestern North Carolina. And so I, the morning of nine 11, I was interviewing as, as I did each day, uh, indigents would come in people with financial problems who needed help, uh, to feed their families. They would come in. I would do a quick intake interview and determine what we could do to help them. Well, one of the clients came in, it was nine something in the morning and, and, uh, said, have you heard what's going on in New, in New York? And I hadn't. So I, I didn't have a television, but I turned on my radio and over, uh, as everything happened, I listened to it. And I, I think what, what struck me, and I think that it, it psychologically traumatized me, like I'm sure it did a lot of people, uh, who, who watched and, and listened, but I could hear the, uh, I don't know if it was Dan rather, or who, I don't remember now which newscaster was talking, but you could hear the, uh, the people screaming, the buildings crumbling, the roar of it all. And all I could think of was, uh, how many thousands of people died? How many thousands of people were just killed? And I, w I was filled with indi indignation. I was raging mad that anyone would do this to us. And so on September 13th, I started an online, uh, investigation group and it grew to become the largest non-government, uh, investigation group. This is before the, the advent of, 
uh, a, a lot of the 9-11 truther movement stuff. I was not thinking this was some kind of conspiracy. I accepted what I was told, which was that 19 uh, Arab hijackers uh, hijacked a bunch of planes, flew it into the towers, and Osama bin Laden is the guy responsible for it. So I created this investigation group with the purpose of trying to gather as much information as we could get as citizens, provide it to the uh, to you know federal intelligence, the FBI, in their investigation to go after Al Qaeda. I wanted to do what I felt was my patriotic duty as an American citizen to stand up for my country against these terrorists. Fair enough. So, so I was very much uh, in the camp that this was exactly what the government said it was. But it's my nature to be flexible and go wherever the facts are. And as time went on, and I began to see, wait a second, there, there, there were so many anomalies here. I gradually came to understand that there was a a cover up, that there were intelligence operatives active in this uh, from the Israeli Mossad. Uh, certainly the FBI had called off a number of investigators. The CIA had a hand in it. And and so from there, that's when I started to wake up. And initially I had been making fun of the conspiracy theorists that would come in to the group and try and make trouble and say, oh, this or this. And like, you know what? You you people are nuts. Yeah. Uh, and and tr- some of them were. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, th- that doesn't mean that there wasn't some truth. And fortunately, uh, I was able to to key into what was real versus what was just outrageous conspiracy theory and go from there. And that opened me up to to going back and reviewing some of the past experiences I had had in my life, the interaction uh, there with what had happened in Southeast Asia. What was the CIA doing there? What Were they the good guys or were they just part of basically an international mafia that wanted their cut of the drug trade. Uh, Same with the FBI. Why were they so determined to take down an honest, good judge? Uh, you know, what, what are they doing? Why, why did they have to resort to, uh, but basically entrapment is exactly what it was of innocent people. So I, I, that was my red pill. 9-11 woke me up, got me looking and I started seeing the world in a different way. And, and and I've continued to this day with the same kind of, uh, I guess, healthy skepticism without jumping off the edge, free falling through a rabbit hole into, you know, some of the more outlandish conspiracy theories that are not grounded in, in you know, factual reality. Brilliant uh, to hear about your, your grandmother. I mean, what a courageous woman um, she was then. I, I don't know if she's still with you, but incredible courage to to stand up to that. You know, I'm, I'm often reminded of, um, it's going to sound a bit silly, but somebody said to me once, they said, Richie, you, you've got this terrible scepticism and these these negative feelings about authority. And I, and I always point them to a little clip from a film that Tom Cruise made with Gene Hackman called The Firm, based on the, the Grisham book. I'm sure you mm. know the film. And, 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 and um, Hackman's character says to Tom Cruise, why did you want to become a lawyer? And Cruz says, well, I remember years ago, he said, I was working for a guy who had a little store. And the guy was a good guy. He was nice. He did everything properly. But, but he didn't know anything about withholding taxes. So he did his taxes, but he made a mistake. And the government came in and destroyed him. Destroyed him, destroyed mm. his family, destroyed his livelihood. I was out of a job. It just wrecked everything. And Hackman says, well, you're an idealist then. And Tom Cruise says, no, I don't know any tax lawyer that wants to be an idealist. It just scared me to realise what the government can do to anybody when it feels like it. Now, Jake, I'm going to just drop in a couple of tweets there. We've got some questions for you. Uh, Jake Morfonios sure. is our guest. Um, if you know Jake, brilliant. If you, if this is the first time you've heard him in the UK, I will put links to his website, which is a very uh, widely read and widely used website. Jake, speaking about Southeast Asia and opium, it's funny that there's a big story in the UK today about some soldiers firing paintball pellets at, the, at a picture of Jeremy Corbyn in Kabul. Mm. It's all much ado about nothing, right? But they've mm-hmm. turned it into a big story. And the question was being asked today, why is the UK military still in Afghanistan? Has it got a lot to do with poppies, Jake? <laughs> right. Why are we in Afghanistan? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's a fair question. I, and I'm glad to hear that, that uh, folks in the UK want to know that the answer to that as well, because here in the United States, you ask the average American 
on the street. Why are we still in Afghanistan? Oh, well, it's to fight the terrorists. Yeah. Wait a second. Wasn't the original argument that we, we were struck on 9-11 and we needed to go in there and get the perpetrator, specifically Osama bin Laden. And because the Taliban wouldn't let, wouldn't just automatically turn him over with, you know, of course we weren't going to give evidence that he had done it, but they wouldn't turn him over. So that was our reason. I mean, that is actually why that's the stated reason why the United States government authorized intervention into Afghanistan to dislodge and capture Osama bin Laden. Well, he was no longer in Afghanistan within a month uh, of that time. Uh, he had, he had fled into Pakistan. And, and so that didn't stop us though from getting in there and it remains the longest running war in U S history. We're now in the process where, uh, Donald Trump is, uh, adopting Eric Prince, uh, Eric Prince, who was the former CEO of Blackwater, his plan to basically privatize Afghanistan, turn it into a, a total mercenary war. Um, and, and so we've got all of this happening, but Americans at least are not asking the question, why a part of it is because honestly, a lot of people don't even know that we're still there because the mainstream media is, is derelict in its duty to report on, on what's going on. So it's, it's out of sight, out of mind. A lot of people don't know it. They don't think about it. Doesn't cross their minds, but we are there in Afghanistan first and foremost, uh, as a staging ground against, uh, a future, future wars. We're there because it's near to, uh, Iran. We're there because we exploit the resources they have. We certainly are exploiting the, uh, the, the opium production, which had been decimated under the, the Taliban. You know, I'm no fan of the, of the Taliban, but, uh, you go back to the 1980s and Ronald Reagan had the, the, uh, the, the leaders of the Taliban sitting in the Oval Office with him talking to America about how the, they are the moral equivalent of America's founding fathers. Uh, you know, I wouldn't certainly wouldn't go that far no. myself. Uh, but at least they were on our side, uh, and the Taliban had eradicated the opium industry the, the, the poppy fields there in Afghanistan. But of course, once we went back in, the first thing that the central intelligence agency did was they got the poppy growing again. They, they got it going. And to, to this day, they, you can go on Google image search and find photo after photo after photo of U S soldiers and Blackwater mercenaries being used as, uh, as guards for these opium fields to keep rival Taliban warlords and others from coming in and destroying the crops. So why is the U S government and the, and the U the, the British, why are we still over there protecting these fields? Well, it provides a great income, massive income. It's off the books. It's, it's uh, black project money. And the central intelligence agency is the number one purveyor of, of the, the drug trade in the world today. Yeah. It's a really good um, answer, uh, Jake. And I must say as well, it isn't just, um, American men and women who are misinformed. The Americans get a bad rap, you know, as if the Americans are stupid and it's completely nonsense. It's just as bad here. You, you know, it, it probably came as a shock to many people in the UK today as they're arguing about why the, why the soldiers were shooting paintball pellets at a Jeremy Corbyn picture. It probably occurred to them, wow, are we still in Afghanistan? Another huge story here, and I, I would like to talk a little bit about Israel and Donald Trump as well. Fascinated to get your opinion on, on that, of course, and, and other things. Jake Morfonios is our guest. Blackstoneintel.com is the website if you haven't been on there before. It's terrific. It is a, it, it's, it's a treasure trove of really important information that you're not getting anywhere else. Jake, um, UK soldiers are fighting with militia groups in Yemen. This is disgusting, isn't it? And, you know, credit and kudos to RT for kind of fleshing this out, Russia Today. And the questions have been asked in Parliament about this in the week, but no answers are yet forthcoming. It was bad enough for many people in the UK that we were selling uh, hundreds of millions of pounds, billions even, worth of weapons to Saudi Arabia that were being used to brutalise Yemeni people. But to find out that special forces are on the ground there, Jake, what have you made of that? Oh, yeah, that that's actually absolutely the case. And uh, there was a report that was published, uh, let's see, 
I don't know, a handful of months ago, um, about, uh, it was, it was published in the Emirati news service. Uh, Al Khalij online was the name of the, uh, the, the media. And they revealed that, uh, the Israeli defense forces w- are running training camps for foreign mercenaries down in the, in the Negev desert, training them to go fight in Yemen. A- and this includes, uh, uh, Middle Eastern forces, Gulf state forces, but also, uh, Western forces They go in there and they're getting training from Israel, uh, which proves the fact that Israel has been playing an active role in this genocidal Saudi war against the the people of Yemen. It it proves that they are fully colluding with the Saudis and the Emiratis in this war. And and the the report that was online quotes U.S. officials uh, who were close to to the United States House Intelligence Committee who know about this Israeli operation, the training operation. And they said that hundreds of mercenaries from multiple nationalities uh, that are fighting on behalf of the UAE in in Yemen and on behalf of Saudi Arabia, uh, they confirmed this. So this is not just the the Gulf state media. This is even uh, officials here in the United States confirming confirming this. And the training camps themselves were created by a... Uh, a man named Mohammed Dal, uh, Dalan, I don't know how you pronounce his name, D-A-H-L-A-N, uh, but he was a former Palestinian politician uh, who was working as an agent, a covert agent for Israeli intelligence who basically had infiltrated the Palestinian circles. And and uh, so for years, this guy, Dalan, had been working within uh, Yasser Arafat's Fatah party, pretty yeah. much helping to guarantee that Fatah would remain in a constant state of friction with Hamas, which was, uh, you know, uh, the, the Israeli plan, keep Fatah and, uh, Hamas fighting. But in 2011, uh, they figured out what he was doing and who he was working for. And the Palestinians expelled him from the party. Uh, and so this guy later served as a security advisor for the crown prince of the, of the UAE. The crown prince is Mohammed bin Zayed. He's kind of like the MBS of the uh, Emiratis. So, so this this former uh, Fatah member, Dalan, who was an agent of Israel, he was in charge of personally overseeing the recruitment of these foreign mercenaries to go fight on behalf of the UAE against Yemen. Um, so, so it's just not even a matter of of dispute. There are foreign training camps uh, that Israel is is providing the training for, and they're bringing in American mercenaries, British mercenaries. They're bringing in mercenaries from all over the place, training them, sending them into Yemen. And so we've got this global military industrial complex that is collaborating and conspiring together to overthrow Yemen, uh, try and kill the Houthis, of course, uh, grab power back for the for the uh, the Saudis. And also set it up in preparation for the the greater war with Iran, which is which is approaching. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that right now. Uh, it's uh, seven minutes to six here in uh, the UK. We've got Jake Morfonios on the line, BlackstoneIntel.com. About time that we got Jake on uh, this program. Uh, extraordinary career Jake has had. We've been talking about British um, soldiers, British troops fighting uh, alongside the Saudi. Um, militias in Yemen and the devastation there. And Jake's been talking about the part that the Israeli government has covertly been uh, playing in in terms of training mercenaries to go in there. Before we come to Iran and the plans for it, in fact, just before we get to that, I would like to talk a little bit about Trump. But before we even go there, how big a part has Israel? Um, and I, you know, you know, we get accused. I certainly get accused of bashing the Israelis uh, a bit too much. Mm-hmm. I mean, my, my own government here, I'm Irish, but my own government here in the UK is equally as culpable. The French are as culpable. The US government is as culpable as uh, as Israel. But we've got to talk about Israel because it's central in the region and in terms of what's going on. What about Syria and some of these lunatic uh, Wahhabists who ended up in Syria that we believe came from Saudi Arabia in many instances, but Israel has had a hand to play, or a part to play too, in sending lunatics into Syria as far back as 2009. I think that's pretty fair to say, Jake. Absolutely, Richie. I I agree with you 100%. Uh, 
Uh, Israel has played up. This is how Israel operates. They've done this in Africa as well. I, I've talked with a lot of Somalis, a lot of Sudanese who's, who talk about this same thing. They don't have the kind of media coverage that 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 we see with the, the Middle East, but it's the same kind of MO. It's the same thing happening throughout the 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 90s, the 2000s. Israel goes in, they back various factions, they arm them, they coordinate them using Mossad intelligence, and, and they step back and let these factions fight each other or, or do their fighting for, on behalf of Israeli interests. Uh, and, and so that's what they do. Uh, they The chaos, much of the chaos going on in in um, Somalia and Sudan right now is because of Israel. Likewise, what's going on there in the Middle East and in the Gulf is largely uh, due to Israeli meddling. Uh, they they most certainly have um, uh, worked with the Saudis. They uh, they have worked with other Gulf states like the Emiratis, and and they offer these. It's just astounding that we have reached the point where the Saudis, who used to at one point uh, stand against the Israelis in the region, who are now absolutely in bed with the Israelis with a common agenda. Uh, It's like, Richie, it it reminds me of uh, um, American mafia families. Uh, For example, in New York City, you've got the, the five main families. There are five families. They are competitors. They they don't like each other, but because they're in the same dirty business, they understand that if one goes down, they all go down. And so they reach across uh, the, the families and they have cooperation on certain things. There's an agreement, unspoken agreements, that you don't, uh, you don't go after each other in ways that could compromise yourself. But at the same time, you can work off each other for mutual benefit, despite being at odds and being competitors uh, on the global stage. It's much, it's much the same way. The Saudis, uh, truth be told, they don't like the Israelis and vice versa, but they have similar interests uh, geopolitically in the region. Uh, the Saudis see Iran as a, as a major uh, foe. Israel certainly sees Iran as a major foe. And so together they work toward the common interest of destabilizing Iran and, and trying to degrade their, uh, basically keep Iran in, in what is a, a Vietnam style, uh, war, a long protracted war where Iran is, is dumping its, its money into backing militias, uh, to try and keep the, the Shiites propped up the, the Shiite power, which has burgeoned after the, the fall of Iraq, after the U S invasion of Iraq, it left a vacuum. Iran being the neighbor of Iraq and with a large Shiite population in Iraq, it made sense that Iran would exert influence there because that's their sphere. Of course, it's their neighborhood, and, absolutely. And so we, we, do have, uh, we do have this geopolitical battle going on, but our media and our politicians will, will cover it up and oversimplify it and just make it a, a good versus evil, uh, us against the terrorist story when there's so much more there uh, sprinkled into all of this are all of the corporations making billions of dollars off the business of war, uh, that we've got all of the lobbyists, uh, especially here in the United States, APAC and other Zionist lobbies that buy up our politicians, uh, and then, uh, charge anybody who speaks out against their, the foreign influence peddling, uh, they just call us anti-Semites to shut us up because it's such a powerful, uh, label. Uh, fortunately we, we do see that changing as it's been so overused uh, at least here in the United States, that people are beginning to wake up to the fact that this is, uh, uh, it's no more accurate to say if you're, if you oppose Israeli Zionism, that makes you a Jew hater. That's no more accurate than saying if you opposed Obamacare, that means you're racist toward blacks. It, it's just a logical fallacy. It is indeed. I, I really like your talk in there about sloganeering as a tool of the establishment to simplify very complicated issues like Iran, axis of evil. We all remember George W. Bush. Um, God, you, I know you read Orwell's 1984, uh, Jake. I've read it. got it on the bookshelf behind it's, me. It's on the bookshelf <laughs> behind you for sure. And you know, the my my fiancé, my longtime partner, Caroline, often refers to it. She often says, look how simple and how ridiculous the language has become. Orwell, of course, talked extensively about that in 
1984. Jake Morphonios is our guest. Blackstoneintel.com. What did you make of the Trump phenomenon when it began, Jake? Because what a story that has been. And in years to come, we will look back on it. We'll write books about it. This man, this guy, this reality television star... The, the guy with the big towers in New York and in Las Vegas with the big mouth ran for president and told everybody what it was that they desperately wanted to hear. Now, I'm no genius and I've never claimed to be one, but I've been around a long time and I didn't believe a word of it. I've not been a believer in politicians for a long time. But people desperately needed to hear it after the Clinton crime cartel. Speaking of speaking of uh, crime families, Jake. So right. what did you make of when Trump was out there on the stump saying this stuff? What did you think? I had, because I had been involved in politics for some years prior to the 2016 election, I had known about Trump's political ambitions uh, far in advance. In fact, back in uh, 88, that was the, I was a teenager. That, that was the first campaign I had ever worked on as a, as a youth coordinator for the George H.W. Bush campaign. Uh, and, and way back then in the 80s, Donald Trump wanted to get in. And he, he stuck his, his toe in the water and decided against it. In 2000, he, wa- he actually threw his hat in the ring and was attempting to get the nomination for the Reform Party. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, uh, that's when he, 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 switched from being a, being a Democrat temporarily. He became an independent, uh, to try and get the reform. Uh, so I actually met his opponent, Pat Buchanan at a conference up in, in, uh, Washington, DC, but I was paying attention to it at the time. I was the state campaign manager for Steve Forbes, who was running on the, uh, for the Republican nomination. Uh, so I, I have had my eye on Donald Trump, uh, over the years, and I've read his art of the deal book numerous times. And the, the guy was just a, a total con man in, in, in my view. He, he had, uh, anytime he decided to run, he would quickly reassess his positions and match his positions to whichever party, uh, that he was trying to appeal to. So here, here I am in 2015 when, when Donald Trump announced his, his candidacy and suddenly a man who had spent in his entire life as being a staunch Democrat, staunchly pro-abortion, uh, pro-late-term abortion, staunchly anti-gun, uh, he really supported gun control, pro-gay rights, a whole lot of things that were typical of, uh, I'm not saying good or bad, I'm just saying these were the typical beliefs. And then in a matter of months, Suddenly he was the, he took the exact opposite position of all of those things, which just, just happened to match up to, uh, what, what the beliefs were of the core that you needed to, to, to appeal to among the Republicans to, to win their, their, uh, to win the primary in, in United States politics. What you do is before you get your party's nomination, you first have to uh, or before you run in the general election, you have to win your party nomination. And so both parties will appeal to the extremists during those primaries. So Donald Trump turned toward the extremist faction because they are the loudest. Uh, they're not necessarily the greatest in number, but they're the loudest and uh, most active in social media and so forth. They're the ones that go out and ex- express great passion. And, and so we appealed to them with a populist message. Uh, and, and I don't disagree with a lot of the things that he was saying. I agree with a great deal of what candidate Donald Trump was saying, but, but what I had a concern with was I knew that Donald Trump by nature was prone to, to switching his positions to only saying what was necessary in the moment, whether it was in his business deals or his politics, he would appeal to that party, say what they wanted him to say win their support and then 
when he no longer needed their support, he would completely abandon them. It could be argued, and, Jake, that that would be typical of any politician. I know some uh, of our listeners would say. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly would be. Certainly would be. Uh, the, the concerns I, I had with Donald Trump, though, was, was that he was not a patriot. He was a man who was loyal first and foremost to the almighty dollar. And, and so when he was saying all throughout 2015 and 16, uh, talking about how we need to go into Syria and take the oil, we need to go into Iraq and take the oil, these things for it, from the, the perspective of a Republican who is supposed to be non-interventionist, you know, believe in a foreign yeah. policy. And so to hear him saying that and still support him demonstrated that there wasn't a whole lot of understanding of of the foundational principles that undergirded the Republican uh, uh, Party platform. He he was rewriting what it meant to be a Republican, and people were like you pointed out, uh, Richie, correctly. People were so sick of the Clinton years and even the Obama years, which, which maybe weren't quite as bad as as uh, the Clinton years, but they were so sick of the corruption. They wanted anybody anybody to come in and and fight against that and so when trump was out there saying in his rallies over and over and over that he was going to lock hillary up people lapped that up and they loved it and they were willing to overlook what their common sense was telling them about donald trump they were willing to just take him at his word he was bombastic he was charismatic he was unlike any politician that we've seen in in modern history uh, because he would just say things so bluntly and people loved it. But now that, you know, as soon as he won the, the, the election, the first interview that he did, he said, you know what? I think Hillary's been through enough yeah, yeah. and I'm not going to be pursuing any charges against her. Let's leave her alone. They're good and, people. They're good people. The right, these are good people. She's yeah. done a great, great things for America. And that has been basically the, the tenor and tone of the, the, the Trump presidency has been walking back on one uh, at his rallies. He will continue to, to say the populist things. But when you look at the actual actions that he takes, they don't match up to the rhetoric. And, uh, and, and so a lot of Trump supporters feel very, very betrayed. Uh, some of them are, are not able to, to acknowledge that he is not necessarily who he presented himself as, and they still desperately want to believe that he is a savior who's going to lock up Hillary and do all these miraculous things. And, uh, you know, those, those people, we just keep appealing to them, uh, with, you know, just common sense, uh, logic and, how do you uh, get to a place, Jake? Sorry to interrupt you there. How do you get to a place where you become so entrenched in believing something that even though it reveals itself to be the opposite of what you believed, that you can't reconcile that and move on? And you start to believe crazy, fanciful notions like Q and on. When I right. first came across this, and I've had some people on my program over the years who've said some very strange things. And sometimes they've been entertaining. Other times they've had some loose evidence to support their kind of out there points of view. But the notion that people would actually believe that Trump is some sort of a secret agent in Washington pretending to be the president while he's really there to bring down the deep state and the neocons. How can people believe that? How do you get to that stage? And these aren't them, a, a small group of people. Millions of people believe this, Jake. Right, right. Yeah, I just saw yesterday. I It, it was kind of shocking to me. I, did, I forget now which video it was on YouTube, but it was a group of Christian preachers who were talking about that day's uh, QAnon drop and, uh, you know, uh, praise the Lord for Donald Trump. And, of, of course, we had uh, the 700 Club here in America, uh, famous uh, TV evangelist Pat Robertson, uh, talking about how he had a vision of Donald Trump sitting on the right hand of God and in heaven and, and just insane stuff. <laughs> yes, how, how do you get to that point where we, we take someone who is – the farthest thing from the example of, of Christian ethics that you could possibly get and, and then see him on the right hand of, of God. 
uh, it, it does take. Um, it's a stretch. I, I, it's a stretch, Jake, it, isn't it? <laughs> it, it? It's a bit of a stretch. Last I checked, God is not big into cheating on your your wives, every single one, and uh, no, no, being a business cheat. But you know, to to each his own. His own. I. But as as far as it, I think that it's a uh, part of it is a general dumbing down of the of the population, where we no longer in schools. Uh, I can't speak uh, for for over in the UK, but in the United States, our public school system no longer teaches critical thinking. Uh, you're you're taught an agenda. You are taught what you are supposed to believe, and you are taught not to question. And so that's how kids are being raised uh, year by year into college. And so they don't stop and analyze. They're just taught to accept. And and uh, it's Very brainwashing. Important. Very it important, is. Jake. Do you know you you might not be aware of this because you've got enough to cover on a daily basis. But I covered a story yesterday. Educational think tanks in this country, and they're very serious about this. They want to introduce career guidance for two year olds in nursery schools. And <laughs> yeah, and you talk about brainwashing. You talk about narrowing the focus and the possibilities for children. This has come in. Let me remind our listeners who um, we are um, speaking with today. I know many of our listeners because Jake, you've been doing this a long time and they're very well aware of who you are. Jake Morfonios is our guest. Um, it's uh, really great to have Jake on today. Blackstoneintel.com. It's uh, coming up for 11 minutes past the hour. Lots to talk about with Jake. He's uh, sticking around. Although we didn't agree on a definite time, Jake, so you can disappear as anytime long as you, you want. want it's great to have you around. I'm on till the top of the hour. So you can stick around for as much of that as you want, Jake. It's great. To, it, it, it's a genuine pleasure to have you on. By the way, our, our mutual friend, uh, Phil Restino in Florida. Phil says, Richie, uh, you need to um, you need to um, make sure that we get the links to the story about the Israelis training uh, people to go into uh, Yemen. Uh, no doubt about that. We will put links out uh, to, to that story. Just go to Jake's website. Uh, as I said, I'll put links out to that there. Jake, loads of questions about your... People want your opinions on people. It's fascinating. Uh, mm. Patrick would like to know, what does Jake think about politicians like Tulsi Gabbard or Andrew Yang? We could even throw Ilan Omar into that. This kind of new or new-ish kind of breed of uh, politicians. Any reason for optimism, Jake, with these people? I think so. I think there is reason for optimism. Um, and as far as uh, my opinion on politics has has evolved over the years, I started out as a staunch Republican, ultra conservative. I was one of those uh, Tucker Carlson back uh, type people who, you know, was <laughs> quick, quick to, you know, quick and sharp in, in my, my, uh, witticisms, or at least I thought I was witty, you know, and, and there, it was more style than substance in a lot of what I was saying. I was very much partisan in my thinking. Um, o over the years I have, I have come to see the, you know, the, the deficits with, with being polarized in a two party system like that. And so I, I'm, I still retain the same basic principles but I'm much more broad in, in my my viewpoints. So, for example, Tulsi Gabbard, I absolutely love. The reason that I, I like Tulsi Gabbard is not because I agree with her domestic agenda. In fact, I, I totally disagree with the vast majority of the things that she would want to do as president domestically. Um, however, Tulsi Gabbard is excellent when it comes to foreign policy. Uh, she is very much opposed to foreign intervention. Uh, she's very much opposed to warmongering. She opposes the military industrial complex corporations that are privatizing wars. Uh, and so I, I agree with her on that. And so because of that, I can say to my audience, uh, in my videos that we should stand behind her for that. Doesn't mean you have to vote for her in, in the general presidential election, but, uh, we need to at least take a, a look at the fact that the democratic, uh, primaries there's Tulsi Gabbard, and then there's a whole host of pro-war, pro-interventionist Democrats that are running. Do we want the Democrat primaries to go through and never hear that alternative voice saying, we don't need to be going into all these wars? Of course not. So that is why I say, even though I'm not a Democrat, even though I have never voted for a Democrat for president, I do support Tulsi Gabbard because of that voice. Uh, same with Ilan Omar. I don't support Ilan Omar uh, with her do, uh, domestic agenda. However, 
she is completely right when it comes to the uh, influence of the Israeli lobby upon the U.S. political system. And so I stand with Elon uh, in social media. I express uh, support for her over and over again because she is willing to speak out for the truth. Jake, how do you think she's coped with the attack? Sorry to interrupt you there, but it's fascinating this. She's obviously been hammered since she dared to tell the truth about APAC and the pact. God, I interviewed Cynthia McKinney several years ago and she laid out from day one when she took her seat as the Georgia congresswoman, she was plagued and harassed by the agents of Israel saying you'll get funding for this and you'll be looked after here if you sign the pledge, if you sign the pledge. So Omar has been hammered. How do you think she's coped with that since? It, it uh, Fortunately, she's a, she's a tough one to crack. Uh, some people will, and we can see it in, in our politicians, some politicians, when you try and shame them publicly, they'll turn around and quickly grovel before your feet uh, because they're afraid they're going to lose political support or whatever else. There are other politicians though, who will, uh, they get energized by the attacks uh, and it, and it further entrenches them in in standing up for what they believe in. And she is one of them. She's, she's been in Congress, you know, she just got in, she has no history. She has no great authority or power. She has very little to lose in Congress. Uh, And so when you are new like that, you're, you're going to be more willing to make waves. And, and that's one of the reasons why I believe we here in the United States, we need term limits for members of, of the House and Senate. Because once you're in there and you have become entrenched and you've become part of the system, part of the swamp, you've got all of your, your corporate sponsors backed up, you're guaranteed to keep winning because they're going to keep uh, funneling money into your campaign because you keep giving them kickbacks. We need to stop it before it gets to that point by term limiting uh, our our representatives. She is a good example of of why we need those term limits. Because when you don't have a whole lot to lose, when you're not entrenched, uh, you're going to fight more for the people and less for the the lobbyists and the special interests. Do you think, um, Jake? That I've often heard it said. I'm a history graduate, and I know that much of what I was taught about history is at least slanted, if not outright wrong in some cases. But um, when I think back to when I was being lectured in school, you know, talking about American politics, it's often said that the founding fathers had this idea that the farmer would go to Washington and represent his district for a couple of years, and then he would go back to the farm and somebody else would do it. And that was their way, way back in the 18th century, of trying to stop career politicians. Do you go along with that? Do you think the founding fathers really imagined a world like that where the farmer would just go up to DC for a couple of years and then go back and let somebody <laughs> else uh, do it? What do you think? Well, there it, we we have trans not exact transcripts, but we have we have notes from a lot of what the what was discussed during the the constitutional convention when these founding fathers from the various colonies got together and were debating how to set up the constitution. They pulled primarily from the works of a British legal scholar, Sir William Blackstone, which is who my, my channel is named after. Uh, So they took his legal theories, his arguments, and they crafted the constitution around it. And when you go back and look at the, at the minutes and the notes from these meetings, there was a great amount of debate about term limits and it was extremely close to, to being codified in the, the original constitution. Um, but there were just enough votes uh, against it, uh, which is why it was excluded. But as uh, t- directly to your question, I don't think that the founding fathers imagined or could have imagined anything about America as it is today. I no. think that, that they are spinning in their graves uh, at what we've become and how we have so perverted uh, the system that that they set up. Uh, they tried and tried and tried to express in their writings and their speeches that if you start getting away from uh, power and authority at the local level, at the state level, and cede too much authority to your federal government and to those representatives, they will take away from you your rights. They will find a way to keep themselves in power and expand their power uh, and, and tax you and create burdens. And, and that's exactly what has happened. So I, I don't fault them for their good intent. Uh, but 
it's just like uh, John Adams and some of our other founders said, when the people themselves allow immorality to become rampant uh, um, and and let the politicians get out of control, they take your liberty. And, and that's exactly what's happening. That's what we've seen. Yeah, the longer they're in, of course, the more corruptible they become and the more easy it is for uh, big business or big corporations to coerce them or to co-opt them. Jake Morfonios is our guest. A lot of interest in this. If I don't get to read your tweet out, uh, I apologise for that. There's been an awful lot of tweets uh, come in. But um, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the plans for Iran in a minute. I know we did say we do that about a half an hour ago. We will talk about Iran because it's very important. And uh, Jake's done a lot of uh, work on this particular subject. Before that, though, something you get hammered for, I think, mm. I think a lot of people get hammered for. How influential are the banking families of Rothschild, Warburg, Oppenheimer um, today in 2019? How influential Mm -hmm. are they in terms of global affairs, uh, Jake, would you say? Well, we we certainly know that that in the past they have been extremely influential. I mean, the House of Rothschild, uh, the banking dynasty that was established in the 1700s that grew and flourished in the 1800s, that's a matter of, of, you know, just historical fact, hard to dispute it. The question is, how much influence do they have today? I think that uh, from the research that I've done, the Rothschild family, uh, you've got Lord Jacob Rothschild there, you've got uh, uh, Evelyn de Evelyn Rothschild, Rothschild yeah. you, you've got uh, Lord Jacob's son, uh, Nat Rothschild. They, the Rothschild family certainly does continue to wield a lot of influence, and, and we can see what they're doing, not so much just as the bankers, but just in, in general uh, types of um, I- investments that they make in corporations that, uh, that you can only in, make a profit off of through the business of war. Uh, Nat Rothschild uh, teamed up with uh, Oleg Deripaska from, from Russia, as well as George Soros in fleecing Montenegro uh, and and some other places. Uh, we, we see Lord Jacob Rothschild sitting on the board of, of Genie Energy, which was given essentially a no-bid contract by Israel to plumb the, the uh, you know, oil and energy in the Golan Heights. And, and so when you realize that, that uh, Jacob Rothschild stands to make a fortune off of uh, uh, the Golan Heights, uh, it kind of makes uh, more remembers. sense. It makes more sense that Donald Trump has suddenly decided to say, out of well, not out of the blue, not out of the blue, but he suddenly says, "We'll recognize Israel's exactly. domain over the Golan Heights." Right. Right. I'm with you. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I don't see. Th- there's certainly the the connections there with with the banks, but I, I think that it is. Um, it wouldn't be accurate just to say that the the Rothschilds are are controlling the whole world. That they they still have vast, incredible influence. That's that's for sure. But uh, since the 17 and 1800s, we we have seen a massive expansion, a, a growth of of multi billionaires who are also keyed in on a lot of this. And so it's no longer just the industry of banking, uh, but it it's it's those to whom the bankers lend the money. So it, it's collusion between the banking houses, uh, but also between these multinational corporations uh, that are making money off the, uh, the the business of war and exploiting the resources of countries that they can go in and, and knock off. And, yeah. and so you've 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 got this this uh, combination uh, of of the the bankers because you you've got to have the lenders to to provide the money. Uh, you've got the multinationals, uh, and, and then you've got the the political puppets. Uh, at the national levels, uh, or in the case of European Union, then uh, you, you've got the supra-national level. They go in there and and uh, ma- gerrymander the the local laws and make it possible for these multinationals to go in and exploit. So I don't I don't look at it simply as uh, the Rothschilds are the problems in the world, but a whole cabal, a whole cadre of of uh, globalist-minded. Uh, capitalist vulture opportunists that that are exploiting uh, the the people and the resources. Yeah, it's very difficult to proper properly quantify the holdings of families like the Rothschilds as well. It's extremely difficult to do that. That's an important thing uh, for people to keep in mind as well. Jake Morfonios is our guest. Jake, speaking of war, um, 
since Trump was elected, since he took the oath of office, he's regularly um, sought to do the Israeli government's bidding on Iran. Do you think there's a definite agenda to push for a major conflict with Iran? Will it be proxy wars fought in the region or could we be looking at something catastrophic like a full-scale military conflict between the Iranians and, you know, a coalition led by the United States? Is that something that's in the future, do you think? I think there's no question that we're we're working toward the overthrow of the Iranian government. Um, I Just they, they're too much of a foil to Israel's interests in the region. Uh, and so Israel is going to do whatever it has to do uh, to to get rid of them, if they can do it through a soft coup, they'll they'll do it that way. But it's it's just not going to happen. The only way that you're going to have a uh, a big change in Iran is not going to be just civil uprising. Although the the CIA is actively trying to stoke that, uh, but it, it's going to take a, a direct war with Iran. Um, so what they're doing now and what they have been doing for a number of years is, is trying to bleed them through this quagmire in the Middle East. Uh, Iran is trying to keep Lebanon propped up, uh, by backing Hezbollah. They're trying to keep Yemen, uh, supplies going into the Houthis in Yemen. They're trying to, uh, keep Assad in power, uh, because he's, he's a friend to Iran, uh, in, in Syria. So all over the place, you've got this Sunni versus Shia fight going on. And so they're they're uh, you combine that with the just apocalyptic sanctions that the United States and the UK and and the West is is uh, hammering down on Iran. And they're trying to collapse their they're trying to weaken them, uh, drain them, ex- expend their their military resources to the extent they can in prep this is just basic sun tzu art of war yeah yeah, it is, <laughs> you, yeah. you take the shots from 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 the sides uh retreat uh, get them to to overexert themselves and when they're weakened then you can take out uh take them out through through direct warfare uh, you will not see israel for example trying to get into a direct war we're going to continue to see these proxy wars um up until uh, what we, we know things are going to be bad when we get to what we're seeing, for example, in Venezuela, uh, where you've got the uprisings, you've got the CIA backed operations to create uh, civil uprising and instability. When that happens in Iran, when the people are marching in the streets and they're setting things on fire, that's when they're most vulnerable and we're most likely to see some cruise missile strikes and other things to try and soften up Iran and, and, and attempt at least at first to take Iran out through uh, a CIA manufactured coup uh, yeah, the, at the, the, at the e- civil, civil level. At the civil level. So the economic conditions are created by the interference by uh, Western countries. We've seen that in Venezuela. Now, my listeners know that I've got great sympathy for people like Salvador Allende and Hugo mm-hmm. Chavez. I don't make any apologies for that. That's just who I am. But I'm happy for people to argue with um, my political points of view. But I do believe in that genuine socialism. I mean, Bernie Sanders is not a socialist. Yeah. Jeremy Corbyn is not a socialist. Um, I've, I've done programs explaining how the wealthy don't have to fear genuine socialists because real socialists don't take money away from wealthy people. But anyway, that's an argument for another day. I'm so glad you brought up Venezuela, Jake. And I know you've been talking about it a lot. We're seeing in Venezuela what we've seen, I think anyway, correct me if, if you think I'm wrong, so many times before the strangling to death of the economy of the country to try and create that uprising that can then be exploited. Maybe I'm simplifying it a bit. What what do you think of what's happening there? Oh, no, you're, you're, you're exactly right. That's that's what they're doing. It, t- before uh, before there's a hot war, and, and history has shown this, especially the 20, history of the 20th century, that prior to any kind of hot war or direct coup, you have an economic assault. You try and weaken the country because if you can take a country out, if you can take a country's leadership out through their own citizens rising up, all the better. You've got you, you know, history will record that it was just the people rising up against a dictator. History will ignore that it was a CIA or Mossad <laughs> instigated yeah. uprising. You know, we leave out those facts uh, like we did with the 1953 Operation Ajax that overthrew the government of Iran. Mossadegh, yeah. Uh, 
so so that's what they're doing in Venezuela, and they've been doing it since the day that Hugo Chavez took power. Back in 99, they started uh, this mess because uh, throughout the 80s, uh, venture capitalists had been really exploiting the oil resources of Venezuela. So uh, with the people living in abject poverty, here comes Chavez who says, let's try something different. He nationalizes it. I don't deny that over the years there are, there is corruption, uh, in the Venezuelan government and yeah. exploitation themselves among the po- political class. But by nationalizing the oil and, uh, you, we see this sudden change in Venezuela, a rapid, uh, a uh, rise in wages, a rapid rise in uh, health care, a rapid rise in literacy rates because they are using the money to benefit their own people, whereas the money previously was going out of the country into the pockets of the multinationals. So they've been after uh, Venezuela for some time. Uh, some time. They, they, they eventually, I believe, knocked off Chavez. I, I believe he was, he was poisoned to death, but... Uh, whether that's true or not, still he's gone. Uh, and and one of the people that was fighting him back then that a lot of people don't know about is Juan Guaido. Juan Guaido is not some figure to come out of nowhere. Juan Guaido was actually trained by uh, the CIA <laughs> or or by a CIA front. Um, so this is news I, to me now. See, I love I love this. I love having um, researchers like you on the program, uh, Jake, journalists. This is news to me, so you're going to have to educate me. My listeners will expect me now to jump down your throat and say, prove it, Jake. How do we know that? <laughs> how, how do we know? How do you know that Guaido was working for the CIA way back then? This is fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Well, let, let me see here if I can pull up the, I'm trying to remember the name of uh, uh, of the organization here. Uh, it makes it makes sense to me. Take your time. I'm going to read a couple of tweets anyway. It's yeah. um, we've got Jake Morfonios on the line, folks. BlackstoneIntel.com. I know um, a lot of our listeners have uh, have known about Jake and regularly visit him on YouTube as well. There's only one Jake Morfonios, so if you go to YouTube and um, put that search term in, you'll find Jake's videos, which are fascinating. He's got a great setup there uh, for um, making. Uh, for doing his reports. Check him out there. Just a couple of quick tweets while he's bringing up this fascinating news. I didn't know this, that uh, Juan Guaido has been around a, a long time. For me, he came, he, you know, I, I believed, of course, that he, he was controlled by the American intelligence agencies, but I thought he was a recent phenomenon. Hi to uh, Patricia, who says, Richie, Israel wants to bring down Iran. The Zionist-controlled media in the US has managed to convince Americans that Iran is the enemy. I would challenge every American to name one thing Iran has done to uh, threaten them, says Patricia. Cheers uh, for that, Patricia, as well. Uh, David says, Iran doesn't have a Rothschild-controlled central bank, so of course uh, there's going to be war. That's from uh, David there. Uh, Hi to Faisal as well. Hi to uh, Patrick, who says, it seems to me that the worst influence in the US Congress is the seemingly omnipotent Israeli lobby. Uh, does Jake think that this could be brought uh, to heel ever? That's a good question. Could it ever be stopped? Education, I suppose, is the only way. Uh, Faisal says, speaking of critical thinking, ask Jake a little bit about Sandy Hook. We might get into that at the end because I've interviewed people sure. like, yeah, I've interviewed people like Wolfgang Halbig and, uh, and James Fetzer. Um, I like to think of myself, uh, Jake, I do get criticism for this. I like to think of myself as a, as a genuine uh, journalist. I come from mainstream as well, like yourself. And when I interviewed Wolfgang and when I interviewed Jim Fetzer, I repeatedly challenged them. So much so yeah. that it really annoyed some of my listeners. Because I don't know if what they're saying is true. I think some people died there. Uh, I don't think that, you know, it, that the whole thing is just a hoax. But I've got some reservations about it like you do. So we might, sure. get, in, we might get into that before we uh, wrap things up. But back to Juan Guaido. This yeah. is fascinating. Go ahead. The, 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 the name that I had forgotten was Otpour. Okay, so you probably know uh, about the white helmets. We know that the white helmets in Syria uh, certainly stage events. Yeah. Uh, the, and they got rock star treatment. Uh, George Clooney out there talking about them and them getting the the Academy Award or whatever it was for, or the documentary about the white helmets. They were turning kind of a, a rock star group despite the fact that they were, they're a, a CIA-backed organization, that they get training and, and assistance. Well, Juan Guaido uh, 
stems from a group called OTPOR. The CIA directly funded OTPOR. This is O-T-P-O-R if anyone wants to look it up. Money from the U.S. government through USAID and through the National Endowment for Democracy. These are slush funds for regime change operations. Anytime anyone hears about USAID or the National Endowment for Democracy, that's all these are. These are CIA slush funds for regime change operations. So out of that, that CIA regime change money, Otpor was created, and they had a major spinoff, a group called Canvas. It was formed in 1998. They, it was created in Serbia, this uh, allegedly what they were there to do was uh, just to oppose, uh, you know, have some protests against Slobodan Milosevic, but they ended up becoming so powerful, they carried out the overthrow of Slobodan Milosevic. So this is a very powerful group. Stratfor uh, is a is a, a private intelligence company. A leaked Stratfor email says that the it, I'll read you the exact quote. The kids who ran Otpor grew up, got suits, designed canvas, and carried out export a revolution uh, and became a uh, export a revolution group that sowed the seeds for a number of color revolutions. So uh, Otpor, funded by the CIA, gave birth to canvas. Those who were trained by Canvas went out and helped to carry out and organize a lot of the color revolutions that we saw over there in, in uh, Eastern Europe. Now, where how does this connect to Juan Guaido? Uh, Juan Guaido was among the people who worked with Canvas, who was trained by Canvas. And um, in October of 2005, Canvas started doing these trainings with a group of student leaders from Venezuela, October of 2005. They trained the student leaders who were to go back and begin initiating an attempted coup against Chavez. That's where Juan Guaido comes into the picture because he was one of the early leaders in this violent anti-government movement that was created by Canvas in, uh, in Venezuela. So as of as of 2005, Juan Guaido, who's working with Canvas, an offshoot of the CIA Otpor group, he is he's doing this, and you uh, he has tried to delete it. Well, he has deleted from his Twitter feed some old videos of him out in the streets with uh, tires and things burning in the background, with uh, the protest group that he was a part of and leading. Uh, they were trying to instigate a civil uprising. Way back then. Way back, Jake. This is, so, this is amazing stuff, this. So Guaido is no, he's no new kid on the block. He's been around for two decades nearly. That For two decades. He, he graduated from his university back in 2007, and he spawned a violent anti-government uh, group. And this group is well known. They called themselves Generation 2007. Generation 2007 was nothing more or less than a CIA-backed regime change activism group. So suddenly back in 2007, Juan Guaido ends up in Washington, D.C., where he, oh, uh, it's a little murky what he was doing there, but he, he ends up training, uh, getting mentored by the executive director of the IMF. Uh, or the guy who used to be the executive director of the IMF. Um, his name was Luis Enrique Beres Betia, a very wealthy Venezuelan man. He had headed the IMF, International Monetary Fund. And, and, and so he begins mentoring Juan Guaido. So Guaido goes back, starts, uh, starts up Generation 2007, and they start carrying out a bunch of street protests. And these become very violent protests that they end up killing a lot of people in the process. Um, and he also back in 2007 started a political party. Uh, and that's the party that he's still uh, a part of. It's a very small political party. Yeah. It's and that's Pop where, popular will. That's the one. And that's where I would have, you know, looking at his story, that's what, that's where it would have, if you look at the, I, I obviously have to get a lot of my daily information from the broadsheet newspapers like everybody else does. I do, of course, uh, thank God there are sources like uh, you, Jake, and others. But um, I, I understood this guy went back to about 
2007 with this party. So this is really important stuff. The the links yeah. you're talking about, our listeners are right on the ball. They're tweeting out these links. And um, as they're tweeting them out, I'm retweeting them. Jake is on Twitter as well, of course. Uh, thousands of followers on Twitter. Go and look for Jake Morfonios on Twitter and you'll find him. So Guido has been the man with the plan, at least as far as the CIA uh, have wanted it to be for, well, for the best part of 12, 13, 14 years. Really important to know this. Really important. Yeah, yeah. And there's a, there's a money trail that we can follow with Juan Guaido. Money was pouring in. So so he he's running Generation 2007, which was the originally the, the street-level goon squad that went out and was uh, carrying out a lot of violent activity. Then he formed his popular will political party as the, the, you know, suit and tie image of, uh, of this, yeah, uh, this yeah. movement. Uh, and, and so money is pouring in a ton of money is pouring in to Juan Guaido's group in, uh, by 2010, this opposition was receiving around $50 million a year from you said, and from the national endowment for democracy. So this is 2010. This is well before what we've heard in, in the news in the last half year. Now, in addition to that financial help from you said, and the national endowment for democracy, Guaido was getting, uh, uh, political support from us diplomats. Uh, he was getting strategic counsel directly from canvas which again was that uh, that that spin off of the US uh, CIA front uh, that was carrying out regime change operations throughout Europe. Uh, Guaido was getting uh, intelligence counsel from Stratfor, the, the private intelligence group. And so back here's what I think is very telling. Back in 2010, and we have the emails that people can search for to verify this, Stratfor and Canvas proposed a plan to uh, Guaido's group that would help to mitigate uh, the, this you know, Bolivarian revolution that's going on under Chavez. What they said, what they proposed was taking advantage of the drought that was going on in Venezuela by helping to knock out the electric grid. They specifically said in this email back in 2010, uh, quote, this could be the watershed event as there is little that Chavez can do to protect the poor from the failure of the electric system. This would likely have the impact of galvanizing public unrest in a way that no opposition group could ever hope to generate. At that point in time, an opposition group would be best served to take advantage of the situation and spin it against Chavez and towards their needs. That's the end of the quote. You know what's really sick about that? And... I don't mean to be patronising to you and I don't mean to be a martyr, but you know what's sickening about that? You should be telling a BBC News anchor this at nine o'clock tonight to an audience of millions. It's sick, isn't it, Jake? It is sick. That they don't want to know. They don't want to know. You have got no resources. It's you and your wits and maybe one or two friends that help you out. I, we do this and we put it out there. They've got journalists, producers, they've got editors, they've got interns... They know this stuff and they withhold this information from the people of the United Kingdom. You shouldn't be telling me this. You should be telling mm. it to an audience of millions. It's sickening, Jake. It's absolutely yeah. sickening. It really is. And I, I, I want to just... Um, this is going to sound like a, a really haphazard and a very blunt segue. Um, sure. But but go to Jake's website. All this information is there. I've tweeted out links to it. It's um, blackstoneintel.com. I just want to use the last seven or eight, nine minutes that we've got left. Thanks for coming on, by the way, Jake. I really appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I'm very honoured that you have Not at on. all. It's a pleasure. Look, um, I have no idea what happened at Sandy Hook. I interviewed right. Wolfgang Halbig years ago and I was compelled when, when, when I made a TV programme in London. I was compelled by the fact that his, his own, his, his own um, experience was, was very interesting. The school safety inspector and of course he'd been the Florida State Trooper. I still believe to this day in my heart of hearts that Wolfgang is sincere. Whether he's right or wrong, he believes right. what he's saying. And I think Jim Fetzer, God love Jim, I, I have a soft spot for Jim. I think Jim believes it as well and, and whether they're wrong or not. I can't imagine that nobody died there, but I, I think there's some really strange things went on that day. My listeners are saying, Richie, ask Jake about this. One of my listeners, Ruth, who's in um, Australia, she says, some of the videos of the parents 
afterwards giving statements to the media. It's all very weird and it's all very hard to believe. Um, Richie, put it to Jake. Why um, does Jake not um, seem seemingly uh, sympathise with Wolfgang or Fetzer? Or does no? I don't know if you do or not, Jake. Yeah. What, what's your take on this? Uh, like most people early on, I I didn't have a doggone clue what happened at Sandy Hook. There were competing ideas. Um, as a matter of just the, my skeptical nature, I immediately wondered. I wonder if if U.S. intelligence had any role that that was played in in this. And, and so I was open to any possibility. I just kept my mind open. I saw what everyone else saw. I saw, for example, the your uh, the the Twitter comment there about the parents. That's a specific reference to Robbie Parker, yeah. who was um, uh, he worked as a uh, as a physician assistant at the Danbury Hospital nearby. His six year old daughter uh, Emily is one of the the twenty children that was killed. And when he comes out from he he emerges from a from a church building to, to go speak to the reporters that are out, uh, CNN and the others are all set up outside. Uh, he is somber looking at first. And then as he approaches the, uh, the, the microphone, somebody says something to him that, that makes him smile. And then he turns around and, and starts, uh, you know, getting choked up and, and teary eyed. And so it looks very disingenuous. Uh, and, and that was my position and I, I, early on. I said the same thing. I said, this, this doesn't seem right, but here's what I discovered, uh, as I continued to look at it, that's only one, that's only part of a 20 minute video. When you watch the, his interview in its entirety, it's a very different picture. He continues to, to kind of, uh, f- uh fluctuate back and forth between smiling and then nearly crying when you watch it in it in its entirety i don't see how anyone can can doubt that this man really is on the verge of a total breakdown he is traumatized he doesn't know uh how to manage this i mean if it happened to anyone else i think it would be uh uh you you may not be the you know come across all that great so here's what i did i decided that rather than go by the opinions of people on youtube I'm going to reach out to the families and I'm going to find out what I can directly. And so I'm not going to name the specific families, but I have spoken with Sandy Hook families. I have spoken with parents. I have asked them to produce documents for me. And so I have looked at death certificates of children. I have looked at birth certificates. Uh, Some of these are available online publicly uh, that have been released. Uh, The, uh, the father of Noah Posner, Lenny. Lenny, yeah. I Lenny. put these I put these points to Fetzer last time he was on. I gave Jim a bit of a chasing uh, on this because I, like yourself, have no dog, to, you know, in right. the fight at all. Um, I still think some crazy things went on. Uh, the children being declared dead, the signs that were there beforehand, the school being in disrepair. I have a lot of questions about it, but I'm very interested yeah. to hear you speak about this. And I put these points to Jim. Go ahead there, um, uh, Jim. Yeah, so... So as I, as I went through and I looked at the the documents myself, I talked with some of the families, had conversations and got the perspective that is different from the perspective of those who say the whole thing is a hoax and no children died and so forth. So from there, I spent hours watching what is anyone can find it online. You just have to know where to look for it. But watching, for example, um, some of the court testimony from the lawsuit between Wolfgang Halbig and, um, uh, Lenny Posner. I watched hours and hours of, of those hearings. Uh, I read transcripts. I looked at all of the evidence. I listened to radio shows. I just took in everything I could from, from both perspectives. And I came away feeling like the evidence that shows that children died at Sandy Hook is so overwhelming. Uh, evidence that is right now being used in multiple defamation suits. So If the story is true that no children died, that would mean, of course, that the, the, you know, children, uh, all of the school students that were, uh, there that day, those aren't the real kids, uh, not real school students. That would mean that the teachers were all fake and are in on the conspiracy. That would mean all of the parents are crisis actors. That means that the police that say they saw the dead bodies, uh, those are crisis. uh, they're, they're in on it. Uh, local state, federal police, all of the, uh, 
vital statistics staff there in Newtown that uh, certify these death certificates, they're in on the conspiracy. Uh, the local judges, the court system is in on the conspiracy. And, and you just go through one after another, after another, after another of all of the different parties Thousands. that would ha have to be in on it. And it just yeah. strains at, 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 at credibility. So my opinion is that children were really killed. My question where I come in and look at it and I see the discrepancies that, that I'm uncomfortable with are, is for example, the background of Adam Lanza. I have on my website, if people go to blackstoneintel.com slash documents, you'll, you'll find links there to over 1500 declassified documents about the Sandy Hook massacre. Um, you'll find links to Adam to 114 pages of the history of Adam Lanza's mental health issues throughout his life and how they were documented throughout his life. So this is a very real person. My question is, uh, the same question that I have about the Boston marathon bombing. And that is, uh, with, with this, uh, Sinaiev brothers, we know at least from the testimony of their mother that the FBI was meeting with them in advance of the uh, the Boston Marathon bombing. Why? What was the FBI's relationship with these brothers yes. uh, yeah. in advance? Same thing with the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. The FBI recruited people who carried out that attack. It was the FBI that gave the uh, detonation components and the bomb materials to the people they recruited to carry out that attack. That's a matter of of historical accuracy that's not a it's not conspiracy theory this is absolute fact you could talk so, about oklahoma too if we wanted and absolutely the, absolutely, absolutely. Right. so so knowing that that is real history and that is what the fbi gets involved in my question is what was it uh when you read the the 114 pages uh, of the medical history they talk about adam lanza's history of mental health problems and it raises a number of things that does show that this guy was you know, pretty messed up, had a, you know, a, a, you can see this is the kind of guy who would do something like this. The question is uh, that I have, the final finding in that report is they say despite all of his mental health problems, there is no explanation they can think of that would explain why he suddenly turned toward an obsession with mass shootings. Yeah. A and so when you look at the, the declassified material that, uh, that the FBI allowed to be released, uh, that was not necessarily collected by the FBI, but, uh, in that it shows that at a certain point, suddenly Adam Lanza starts up conversations with some online anonymous people who are helping him to develop this obsession with mass shootings. My question uh, would be, the, the conspiracy theory that I am interested in is whether or not there wasn't some grooming of Adam Lanza uh, that would have uh, taken advantage of, of his mental health issues and encouraged him to to carry something out. You know what, there, Jake? I, that's just a matter of speculation on my yeah. point. It's so it's not that I think there's nothing strange that happened there. It's just that I I have a different set of concerns than those who say that no children died. Yeah, that's that's really important. I put those points to both um, Wolfgang and to Jim. I said, look, why 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 were you so determined that no ch no children died? I can understand your grave concerns about, like like you, they talked about, Wolfgang did about Lanza and the issues around him. There's obviously something very smelly going on there. And um, I'm totally down with, uh, with, with, with that. I don't know that nobody died. I don't know that, that, that anybody died. But I would lean towards, yes, I, I believe these parents are sincere. I believe that there was loss of life on the day, but could there have been something else really negative going right. on there? It, 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 it's, it's only right and proper to ask, and fair, fair play, kudos to you for saying, look, we know that the intelligence agencies have done some terrible things in terms of killing innocent people to further agendas domestically and overseas. And I repeatedly put that to Jim and to Wolfgang and to others, but they weren't for moving. Some of my listeners are saying, we'll never believe it, Richie. We'll never believe the parents. We, we saw the videos with our own eyes. And that's fair enough as well. Where I get cheesed off is where people 
why have we become so narcissistic that when Jake Morfonios or somebody else says, well, I think people did die, that all of a sudden you become sort of some sort of CIA shill. How, right. did, we, how did we get to that? You know what I mean? It's your opinion. Well, it's crazy. Richie, to, to that point, and of, uh, I have, uh, I've got about a quarter million uh, subscribers on my YouTube you channel. You have. It's massive, Jake. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the only subject that I have ever covered that has generated massive amount of hate <laughs> <laughs> yeah proper yeah it, it is this subject i mean a massive amount people get triggered over this issue greater than any other topic i've ever covered and i cover a lot of controversial topics but this one the amount of vitriol and just outright uh one guy wrote to me this week said he's going to find me and come break my jaw yeah, that's uh, ridiculous. I mean, just profuse ridiculous, yeah. profanity and uh and violent threats and so because of that uh, it makes me wonder, how is it that me having the opinion uh, that no children died would generate such a violent response? So if I were to put on my my tinfoil hat and and speculate as to what this means, it seems to suggest to me that there is an element among uh, the the, uh, the the population out there that has been uh, mind programmed <laughs> to to have this violent reaction to, to, uh, you know, that what, what triggers them is simply a difference of opinion. Yeah. Well, they love you. You see, they, they get to love people who challenge the establishment and they fall in love with Jake Morfonios. Uh, I, I, of course, I mean, metaphorically, they love sure. the fact that you do investigations and that you talk about things that the mainstream won't. And they, they form a relationship with you. I mean, I, I, I came through the bloody media. So I understand. And then all of a sudden, they're so entrenched in a position and you go against it. It's like an amazing betrayal to them and, right. and they can't um, deal with it. We've got 60, 60 or 80 seconds left, which is uh, a tragedy. I want to mention again, I don't think I need to mention it, but blackstoneintel.com is uh, Jake's uh, website. Jake, it was a, a great pleasure to have you on today. Thanks for speaking and chatting to me about so many different subjects. Um, come back any time in the future that you've got some free time. You'll, you'll be welcome back any time. I, I know you get a lot of requests to do uh, these types of uh, programmes. But thanks for your time today. I'm giving you the absolute final word and then I'm wrapping it up, Jake. Thank you again. Richie, I so appreciate the courtesy uh, th th that you showed. Um, and I guess I would just end with the final point that m my my biggest message lately has been it doesn't matter uh, what the uh, differences that we have on various things, whether it's politics or conspiracies or whatever. What matters more than anything is that we remain united as as you know brothers and, and sisters in the just as humans <laughs> against yeah. the common foe. We are not each other's enemies. The true enemies, despite our differences of opinion, are those that are trying to take away our rights. And we need to remain focused and not let them divide us uh, and turn us against each other. I can't add anything to that, Jake. Thanks for coming on. I look forward to speaking to you again uh, in the future. Sadly, I won't be able to speak with you uh, off air. You've got to run off and I've got to get this on to uh, podcast and YouTube. But it's been live. Huge amount of tweets came in. Uh, thanks um, again to Jake Morfonios. And um, Godspeed to you, Jake. And I look forward to next time. Look after yourself. Thank you so much, Richie. That was uh, Jake Morfonios. What a, what a guy. What a great uh, conversation that was. Go to his website, blackstoneintel.com. That's it for the programme. Thanks for the tweets going out with some Bob Seeger. Yeah, it's classic rock on the Richie Allen Show today. Brilliant speaking to Jake. Yeah, thanks to him for making that happen. Until tomorrow, look after yourselves and one another. When you're talking about Sandy Hook, I'm not telling you that you're wrong. I don't know. I respect your opinion and I respect to differ, all right? See you tomorrow. Bob Seeger, Hollywood Nights. Bye now.